You're watching World Insight with me, Tian Wei. The program is coming to you on CGTN. In the past years of the Belt and Road Initiative, dozens of countries, companies, and international organizations have already signed up. As a result, this cooperation network has expanded rapidly with each party on board the vision of a shared future. And that also steps up South-South cooperation. South-South cooperation used to describe developing countries helping one another and working for future development. But now, with the Belt and Road Initiative, a large platform for cooperation among South countries, more people have realized how to help different economies build their capacity for growth. And for more on South House cooperation and the potential of Belt and Road Initiative, in our studio we have uh, Sanusha Naidu, who is a senior fellow from the Institute for Global Dialogue based at the University of South Africa in Pretoria. Also, we are joined here by Amir Hashmi, who is the president of Global Think Tank and Network. He's also a senior fellow over there. And last but not least, the Professor Wang Suo Lao, Associate Professor from the School of International Studies at Peking University. Welcome. South-South cooperation, ladies and gentlemen, that has been a phrase talked for a long time. And yet, some say it has not necessarily reached its full potential. Will there be a possibility that BRI would give it a boost? Let's go to you, Mr. Hashmi. Uh, definitely. I think um, how we view it from Pakistan and our relationship with China, um, we've got a very special project as part of the BRI. It's called the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. That's right. Um, it's very new um, because uh, it started about, it was announced uh, in 2013 by our last government and Pakistan has just gone through elections in 2018. Right. But uh, I think the scope of the project um, includes rails, railway, highways, ports, energy, and also uh, special economic zones that um, China has a lot of experience in. And in, for Pakistan, the, the short-term projects that are being implemented right now, it's certainly we've seen a wave of change from where we had skeptics, of course from the Western countries, but also in our Asia-Pac region. Yeah. Um, we've now seen that European countries, Middle East, and even um, some Canadian companies want to join as part of CPAC. Mm. So both governments have now been a little flexible to allow cooperation yeah. and co-financing, um, co-partnership, co-manufacturing within uh, the CPAC project. And it's viewed as a positive signal to BRI. It's very interesting, Mr. Hashmi, you talk about another level of cooperation in a way. It's not just South and South, but rather South and South partners bringing in more players onto the same platform and be able to develop from there. That's exciting, isn't it, uh, to you, uh, Ms. Naidu, because earlier we only see developing countries with the, you know, the great will coming from uh, uh, the the earlier 1950s, the mm -hmm. political will to work together, but now there are things that can be pinned down, not only among ourselves, but also other players at the same time. Definitely. I think that the, the real essence of South-South cooperation is about technically as well as practically implementing projects that the South can actually bring for the South. Mm. So if you think of development and you look at development and you think of when South South Corporation was conceptualized in the 1950s yes. through the Bandung Conference spirit. And then you. That was pretty much a political. Political thing. consensus, exactly. a broad alignment to a kind of set of eight principles that Zhou Enlai unveiled in, in Ghana, uh, which continued under this uh, banner of non alignment. I think today what, we want, what we're seeing is an expression of that non-alignment mm -hmm. to a large extent trying to understand how the South can actually provide development by the South, for the South, of the South. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, a, a key dimension of what countries like China and other countries who are playing critical roles. For example, in, in a, Africa. In Africa as well. So the other important challenge, I think, uh, is to develop the consensus around the implementation of not just 
development cooperation, but understanding that the world in the 21st century is really about trade, finance, investment. Mm. And how do you bring those dynamics to a practical implementation around financial stability, economic development, prosperity, inclusive uh, prosperity, growth, and so forth. Right. Uh, what's interesting, I think, is the fact that this is also the, the 40th anniversary of the second dimension of South-South Cooperation, which is the Beige, uh, which is the Buenos Aires Plan of Action, That's which right. was BAPA, which happened in March of this year. And that in itself is another expression of a different spirit around the technical uh, cooperation. What's going to be really important is countries coming together, as my colleague had mentioned, mm -hmm. with regard to not just investment, not just about cooperation, but trade and allowing different a actors to provide equity. Right. We talk about Asia, for example, South Asia. Uh, also in Africa, a lot of emerging and developing countries at the same time. I know, Professor Wong, your expertise is really about West Asia, particularly in the Middle East. There are certainly also a lot of initiative over there, but one has to mention uh, the political instability of the region did hinder from time to time the real South-South cooperation uh, to start with the real on the real term. So what do you think about the potential over there, Professor Wang? Okay, <clears throat> first I, I want to add something. It, of course, South-South cooperation is a long, uh, has a long history. But now, South-South cooperation in a globalization era. Mm -hmm. So it must have been some new contents. Uh, take the example of Middle East. Many uh, South, South country, uh, in the past, they are poor country. Uh, they also, they have a, they have a rich uh, natural resources for instance, some Gulf countries. Now China, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, rapid uh, economic growth, we need to uh, have uh, energy cooperation with the Middle Eastern country. And the Middle Eastern countries have uh, rich energy. They also need to make cooperation with other countries like mm -hmm. China. So I think uh, in the near future, uh, Middle Eastern countries, they have the huge opportunities to find their way to develop themselves and also that could benefit other areas like China and other countries. Mm. There's a lot of pragmatism in the air, I have to say, while listening to your answers. <laughs> but you know, the devils rather are in the details. If we talk mm. about some of the specific pragmatic products, mm. uh, Mr. Hashmi, for example, in mm. SIPA, uh, which is the economic corridor. So what do you think about now the stage. Earlier there was issues about funding, whether there's debt trap and things like that, and whether the political situation in Pakistan is stable enough, and whether the real players from the, from the other side of the world, more than just China, are likely to play a real role over there. So you have really questions coming from different layers, Mr. Yeah, Hashim. Yeah. Well, I'll address the political one first. So, uh, <laughs> I guess it takes a Pakistani to address that question. <laughs> yeah. So, 2008, um, we had President Musharraf, who was a who was a general, um, as he uh, left the post of the presidency. And 2008 to 13, we had democratic transition, and we had elections. And 2013 to 18, again, a five-year electoral democratic government. And again, 2018, we have a new one. So in fact, the prime minister will be attending the BRI summit invited by president of China. So in that terms, you have stability in the political system right now. Mm. And as far as uh, some uh, sentiments from the West, of course, Pakistan has been a strong ally of the US. And we've been iron brothers with China. So the two strong relationships that we've seen um, economic aid has flowed in from the U.S. in the past decades, mm. and of course China. As a result of war against terror, but of course uh, the two countries were also sometimes not necessarily in agreement about correct. the direction to fight the terror and the degrees to fight terror. Correct, correct. Pakistan has foot a bill of about uh, estimated $120 billion since the war on terror, so it's hurt us economically. But with China, um, uh, I want to pick up on what Professor Wang said. Um, on the South-South relationship in, in our side of the world, if you see the global wealth, it's shifting towards our side of the world. Mm. China's key role 
that is viewed from Pakistan, and of course I've spent a lot of time in the US, Canada, and Europe as well, um, it's the leadership and governance, the meritocracy that the Chinese uh, leadership implemented in the last 30 years that has allowed the whole region and in, in sync with a BRI, I think it's a positive sign. Mm. Um, the world can't be just dominated uh, in terms of Western powers dictating to our side of the world. So the equilibrium will start coming into place in the next decade. Mm. Yes. What about for China? I mean, from your perspective, yeah. Professor Wang, China has to do its own things well. The economy slows down only to a certain degree because of the huge, uh, massive uh, base over there. Six to 6.5 percent is already quite something. But still, people think about Chinese economy and say whether it's going to be stable, whether it's going really likely to fund, for example, some of the initiative China brought up in the BRI, and also be able to work with others on the best practices Yes. when doing BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative? You see, uh, since the recent years, take the example of the Middle East, China already hold the uh, uh, China-Arab Cooperation Forum and China-Africa uh, Cooperation Forum, and, uh, and China uh, inaugurated many projects with the Middle Eastern countries and uh, invest a lot of money there. Mm. When China uh, grow fast, and the Middle Eastern country can also benefit from China's growth. Uh, and also the- And vice versa. Yeah, vice versa, the same. Recently, as you know, saw the Queen Prince Salman with China mm. in uh, February and invest a lot of money in China. Right. So we, also, we often say that, so the BRR BR, BR is a ben beneficial project, a benefit to both sides, not only China. Mm. Well, we could talk about this and enjoy it ourselves, but many around the world watching our program say, really? Have you guys been doing a good job when it comes to the very beginning until today, the development of BRI? Because if you look, read the international press, there seems to be a lot of skepticism. Well, you could complain whether it's fair or not, but certainly there are issues that things can work for the better. Yeah, I mean, the interesting thing about this debate or, or the way China is um, rolling out BRI mm -hmm. is the essential notion that the mirror has two faces. And there's a positive side, but there's also a, a side where you have to deal with the criticism in terms of what's happening. So and you have to learn to deal with the learn, criticism. Learn to deal with it. Yeah. But the big question, if we, if we take Africa, is trying to not to do what Western powers did in Africa and trying to do things differently. But in the process of trying to do things differently, you've got to also realize that there's a political competition that takes place, a geostrategic rivalry, mm. where, for example, the Trump presidency has produced a white paper on Africa, which has nothing to do with Africa, but everything to do with how to contain China in Africa. How does China react to that? That's an how interesting interpretation of that That's document. my interpretation <laughs> of it, right? So that's my point. The second thing is, how do recipient countries perceive you in their political landscape, in their structural conditions. Exactly. And you've got to understand that there's not a hom homogenous approach to countries. The, in Africa, it's a very diverse, it's a very heterogeneous society. Um, if you take Sudan, for example, and just looking at what's happening in yeah. Sudan, and understanding what are the relationships and why Sudan actually went down the route that it did in the right. last couple and of days. And also South Africa, the and changes taking Africa, place over the election. My own country, which I can feel authoritative to talk about, is the fact that you have a country where, at the moment, there's a lot of tension around this 25 year of yeah. democracy. Yeah. Whether we want to acknowledge it or not acknowledge it, there are serious structural conditions of issues that haven't been met. There's a society out there that is reacting to this government. Yeah. So in that context, the last point I want to make is, as China moves with BRI, it also has to realize that it has to deal with those countries coming up that will challenge it well, in the process. It's very interesting what you have just mentioned because on the one hand, you know, non-interference into others' internal affairs. That is coming from the Bandung Conference in the 1950s. Exactly. Uh, uh, Non-alignment movement also, but at the same time, when you are working with a country, 
you have to understand the political situation and the landscape over there and possible the changes could be dramatic at the same time. Professor Wang, there are of course competing voices. That's just natural. It's the state of the world. And there are also competing mechanisms for global development. That's even better because you want to have competition and that so that all the players on different size of the platforms would do a better job out of competition. Professor Wang, how, is, how sophisticated is China about this now? Let's say since the beginning of the BRI. It's been only a few years, but it's been quite a learning curve, I would say. <clears throat> Actually, uh, in many countries, they have their own development plan. For instance, in many Middle, Middle Eastern countries, they have our they have their so-called 2030 vision, right? Uh, just like uh, Saudi Arabia did, and in Turkey they have the plan. In, they call it uh, uh, it's uh, the middle 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 uh, reach plan or something uh, like that. They want to uh, connect it with China. So when China, uh, when our president uh, in inaugurated the plan uh, six years ago, they immediately uh, received welcome from many developing countries, mm -hmm. not all the countries, of course. Mm -hmm. Some countries at the beginning, they hesitate. They have their worry. And gradually, gradually, even Italy, one of the G7 countries, okay. realized it's a peaceful plan and it could benefit many countries. Mm -hmm. So China's growth is quite different. China's rise is quite different from the traditional uh, big powers mm -hmm. because we think the peaceful rise is our job. Mm -hmm. So, and also, just as you mentioned before, Non-interference is one of the most important policy. policy. That is mean, what's the difference between China and the traditional Western power? I think non-interference is one of them. Well, we have a very interesting discussion today, I think. Every one of you I know has a lot more than what you have just said today uh, to contribute to this discussion. But our time is very limited. And we would love to learn from all of you, our brothers and sisters coming from developing and emerging economies. This is going to be a very exciting trip in a way that all of us can take together. Thank you so much uh, for now, Mr. Amir Hashmi and uh, uh, Sanusha Naidu. Last but not least, uh, Professor Wang Suo Lao. Thank you. And that is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us World Inside CGTN into your search engine or check out our YouTube channel. You can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Sina Weibo. From Yitian Wei and everyone on the World Inside team, thanks for watching and tune in again next time for more insights across China and around the world. Good night.